Hello everybody, this is Dr. Nadeem and we are with Neelam Path Lectures. As you are aware, all our lectures are available on YouTube. You can easily download them and you can watch them at your convenience. We also have a Telegram group which you can join and this is very helpful for accessing all lecture related information. We also have a Google Drive where the PDF of all the lectures are uploaded and we have a master integration key which helps you in navigating between the PDF and the videos. These are the disclaimers and we are with phase three which is recorded pathology lectures and today we are with Pursue 19F which is hematology, hemostasis and thrombosis and we are streaming from SMS Medical College Jaipur and the topic of the day is the vascular purpuras and to talk on that we have Dr. Nidhi Sharma. She is an MBBS from CMC Kumbatur, an MD from PGI Chandigarh. She is an associate professor in SMS Medical College Jaipur with multiple publications in international and national journals. She has also authored several chapters in various prestigious books. Presently, she is a faculty at the Advanced Hematology and HLA Lab at the SMS Hospital Jaipur and actively involved in the diagnostic workup of HPLC, flow cytometry, coagulation, HLA typing for kidney transplant as well as for celiac diseases, cross match for transplants. Her areas of interest include hematological malignancies, transplant pathologies in the liver, kidney and bone marrow. With this, I would request Dr. Nidhi Sharma, ma'am, please start your lecture on the vascular purpurus. Thank you so much. I would like to begin by thanking Dr. Nadeem, who has started this wonderful initiative of this academic platform, wherein we all can interact and learn from each other. My name is Dr. Nidhi Sharma, I'm an associate professor at the Advanced Hematology Lab at SMS Medical College, Jaipur. The topic that I would be discussing is the vascular purpura. So what is a purpura? It is a term that is used to describe the skin lesions that develop when RBCs extravasate from the capillaries, meaning whenever there is extravasation of RBCs in the skin or the mucosal membrane, the lesion that we see is called as purpura. The purpura can represent many conditions. It can be something as benign as any trauma that one has uh, uh, just undergone, or it may be the presenting sign of a life-threatening disease. What is not important is the color of the lesion. That's because the color of the lesion depends upon so many factors other than the actual cause of the purpuras, and that is why we do not pay much heed to it. It would depend upon the age of the lesion, the color of the skin and the fragility of the surrounding tissue and that is why the color of the lesion is not important. Whenever, we lesion, uh, whenever any lesion is labeled as purpura, it is confirmed uh, as uh, being a purpura by the dioscopy test. In the dioscopy test, we take a glass light and try to blanch the discolored area. If the lesion blanches, then it is not a purpura because classically the purpuric lesions do not blanch. And hence, once it is confirmed, we begin our investigation for the cause of purpura. So how are purpuras caused? There are three factors which can be contributory to the causing a purpura. These can be platelet related factors or coagulation pathway related factors or factors pertaining to the vessel. So in this particular lecture, we are only going to concentrate on the vascular causes of purpura. That is, we are going to discuss only the vascular purpuras. It is possible to distinguish uh, to a broader extent these three kind of purpuras, whether they result from platelet disorders or vascular disorders or coagulation disorders. The uh, vascular tissue disorders are more common in females. The family history is usually negative in platelet disorders. The site again is very important as the vessel related uh, purpuras usually will present in the mucosal membranes like for example nasal and other mucosal membranes. Whereas if coagulation pathway is the culprit then you will see the purpuric lesions in the larger joints, muscles and visceral organs. So whenever you see a purpura what are questions should come to your mind. 
The first and foremost is the morphology of the lesion. So as we'll see in the subsequent slides, the purpuras can be morphologically of various types. And once you pinpoint the type of morphology, you can limit yourself to a particular few causes of purpura. You should pay attention to the status of the patient, meaning whether the patient is critically ill or his vitals are stable. The location of the lesion, whether they are on the lower extremities, on the extensor surfaces, on gravity dependent areas, uh, helps in making the final diagnosis of the cause of purpura. Patient's past medical and family history will help you make out the diagnosis of the inherited causes of purpura very easily. Any pertinent positives on review of systems, any hepatomegaly, any splenomegaly, the involvement of renal or neurological uh, areas also will help you limit the causes. And lastly, any additional relevant physical exam findings, for example, any lymphadenopathy which is associated with purpuras, any nodules, any ulcers, again will give you another set of differential diagnosis. So it's important that if you see a lesion like purpura, you pay attention to these six causes. So I have, uh, in my lecture, I have discussed purpura by categorizing them into various morphological types. If you will follow any other textbook or any other journals, you will find various other uh, methods of discussing purpura. But in this particular uh, talk, what we are doing is we are trying to classify the purpuras based on their morphology. And then I'm going to enlist the important vascular causes of those kind of purpuras and the important ones we'll discuss in detail. So we begin by petechiae. What exactly are petechiae? They are defined as non-blanching purpuric small macules, which are usually 4 mm or less in diameter. If you see a lesion like a petechiae, the most common cause is often the uh, platelet-related causes, and therefore these, these come uh, to uh, uh, attention more. But in this lecture, we are not concentrating on them, so I'm going to discuss only the non-platelet-related or the vascular causes of petechiae. And this is the list of the causes. The important ones amongst these are trauma, scurvy, hypergamma globinomic purpura of Waldenstrom, and pigmented purpuric dermatosis. Trauma is in fact the most common etiology of purpura in children. This kind of purpura is usually located on extensor surfaces and very close to bony prominences on areas you know where the child the children are very prone to get hurt and hence have a purpura. There are signs which may suggest a possibility of intentional trauma and for medical legal purposes, one must be aware to look for any purpura on unusual sites like face, back, upper arms, etc. and suggest a possibility of intentional trauma. Various other types of traumatic purpuras have been described. There is one mention of sucker daddy or cyclops purpura in literature, wherein the use of particular kind of toys, which used to have a sucker kind of mechanism could lead to a purpura. The love bite again is a kind of traumatic purpura. The Cullen sign, which is a sign of hemorrhagic uh, pancreatitis is actually a type of uh, traumatic purpura. Similarly is the great turner sign, which is again a type of traumatic or trauma-induced purpura. The raccoon sign, wherein one has these purpuric lesions around the orbit, is a sign of trauma to the basilar skull or, or the basilar skull fracture. Similarly is the battle sign, which is a sign of trauma to the head. So these are all the various types of traumatic purpura that one can see. The second commonest uh, cause of uh, petechiae is scurvy or the deficiency of vitamin C. Why vitamin C deficiency results in purpura is because vitamin C is very important in, in, in good collagen synthesis and impaired collagen synthesis in the uh, deficiency of vitamin C will cause leaky uh, blood vessels and hence result in purpura. This uh, is associated with gum bleeding and other petechiae or even ecchymosis. 
Another important sign is that in this kind of purpura, usually there is prominence of hair follicles on the thighs and the hairs are fragmented and they have a characteristic corkscrew appearance which makes the diagnosis clinically uh, very easy. So this is the kind of petechia along, along with some coiled hair like um, corkscrew kind of hair like structures and uh, if you just give vitamin C to the patients, they will respond very well. The next important cause is pigmented purpuric dermatosis or PPDs also known as capillaritis. It's a chronic benign cutaneous eruption usually seen in the legs of the elderly and the classical site is the lower extremities. So this is a flat kind of pulpura and clinically uh, if you see this bilateral distribution in elderly we know we are dealing with PPDs. Now PPDs actually are of various types uh, clinically. The most common type is known as Schamberg's type and uh, although skin biopsy is not needed if done, the skin biopsy is actually again very um, classical. So this is how the lesion will look clinically on bilateral lower legs of the extremities and if you take a biopsy from the lesion, it will show the uh, four characteristic features which are the dilated blood vessels with endothelial swelling, the deposition of hemosiderin, RBC's extravasation and perivascular lymphocytic macrophage infiltration. So uh, this is how it will look. You will have dilated blood vessels and there will be perivascular lichenide kind of infiltrate. You can see RBC's extravasation. The next cause of PTK is hypergamma globulinemic purpura of Waldenstrom. This condition is mainly seen in middle-aged females and the features that they will have is purpura on the lower extremities with raised ESR and polyclonal gammopathy. If we do a histopathology from this lesion, we will find features similar to LCB which we will be discussing in subsequent slides. So clinically, this is how it will look in middle-aged females, this kind of PTK with mild erythema in bilateral legs and the ESR is usually raised and uh, polyclonal gammopathy is associated with this kind of lesion. So if I try to sum up the various PTK and the various uh, uh, evaluation of a patient who presents with PTK, one must pay uh, good importance to the medical history and medication exposure. It's very important to rule out that platelets are not the culprits and do a platelet count as well as the platelet function. So make sure that you are not dealing with any thrombocyte uh, or platelet related causes of uh, PTK. So the second type of purpura that we are going to discuss is macular purpura. So what are macules? They are purpuric patches which are larger than petechiae. Usually they are 5 mm or more in size and uh, most of the time one has to resent to a biopsy uh, to come to a final diagnosis of this kind of purpura. So when one is taking a biopsy, the biopsy should be performed from the center of an involved area and it is a good practice if one can send culture along with the biopsy because infection is one of the commonest causes of this kind of uh, purpura. So here I have enlisted the various causes of uh, macular purpura and out of this table what we are discussing in detail is leukocytoclastic vasculitis uh, which is uh, uh, pretty common. So it is actually a histological, uh, uh, histopathological entity which is characterized by leukocytoclasia. That means there is disintegration of neutrophil nuclei into various fragments or nuclear dust. Along with this, you will see fibrinoid necrosis and other signs of damage of vessel wall like extravasation of RBCs and damaged endothelial cells. What one must remember is that LCV is only a histopathological entity. It is, it, it is not any specific entity and this kind of histopathological pattern can be seen in a variety of clinical conditions. So this is how it can look clinically. There can be various kinds of purpura. So while I am enlisting and trying to enlist the types of purpura into a various morphological type, what one has to remember is that they, one type often overlaps or coexists with other types of purpura and therefore they almost seldom actually seen in um, solitary kind one kind of lesion so here as you can see it can be a purpura it can be a confluence of purpura or associated with some urticarial wheels 
the bullous hemorrhagic areas can be seen sometimes rarely ulcers can also be seen along with this so this kind of varied clinical presentation can be seen and therefore biopsy is often uh, resorted to uh, so when uh, once uh, uh, the uh, pattern of lcv is seen histopathologically the causes of hist uh, lcv can be uh, worked up the chcc has come up with a histological uh, a classification of uh, the causes of lcv that it can be anti associated vasculitis it could result because of immune complex vasculitis or some systemic diseases like rheumatoid arthritis sle could have resulted in histomorphological uh, lcv kind of condition or other probable etiologies like infections medications sepsis or cancer can also give lcv kind of picture so this is what uh, i have described that there is uh, fibrinoid necrosis of the vessel wall one can find the uh, fragmented neutrophils extravasation of rbcs and uh, these are the various things which pin points to diagnosis of lcv histopathologically now uh, along with this you know uh, sometimes we uh, 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 resort to um, immunofluorescence uh, staining and it's a very good practice to um, do a diff uh, in all skin biopsies so as that something is not missed out in lcv also sometimes iga deposits surrounding the cutaneous vessel wall can be seen the third type of purpura is known as the palpable purpura so what is palpable purpura they are defined as round and non blanching kind of papules and usually they will have a component of erythema associated with them so when one sees palpable purpura the underlying uh, pathology is mostly due to a cutaneous small vessel vasculitis uh, or some other kind of vasculitis and the vasculitis in palpable purpura can be divided resulting due to two causes one is the immune complex related vasculitis and the other is the posse immune complex vasculitis now vasculitis is in itself a huge topic and needs to be discussed in really detail and uh, the flow of purpura would be actually not uh, uh, in continuum if i uh, discuss vasculitis in detail and therefore we uh, we will only broadly see the how vasculitis results in purpura in this particular lecture so i said there are of two main types immune complex vasculitis and uh, posse immune complex vasculitis and um, if you discuss immune complex uh, in particular most of the cases of immune complex mediated vasculitis are idiopathic in nature the around 20% of them result because of infections and inflammatory disorders medications uh, uh, or drug induced this kind of vasculitis account for 10 to 15% and malignancy can also be cause of an immune complex related vasculitis whereas if you discuss posse immune vasculitis we know it is because of anka vasculitis or microscopic polyangiitis gpa is no fully granulomatosis with polyangiitis or levomesol associated purpura are included in the list now there has been various uh, upgradations of the terminologies used in the classification system uh, that one follows while discussing uh, uh, vasculitis now, the international chapel hill consensus conference has developed one of the most widely used nomenclatures that one uses while to describe vasculitis in this particular uh, classification the vasculitis are classified into three categories which is uh, according to the size of the vessel the organ involved and the underlying disease that the patient has and uh, these are the various classification groups which are used by chcc they include the large vessel vasculitis medium vessel vasculitis small vessel variable vessel single organ vasculitis or the vasculitis which is associated with systemic diseases and other probable etiologies now of all these categories in particular the uh, small vessel vasculitis has been taken up in further details and uh, recently the american college of rheumatology and european alliance of associations for rheumatology classification criteria has uh, again discussed the types of uh, anka associated vasculitis 
and they say that anchor associated vasculitis is now further of these three types gpa mp and egpa and uh, they also have attempted to categorize this aav according to the type of anka which is present whether it is mpo anka and uh, or uh, proteinase 3 anka or an anka negative vasculitis so they have actually come up with a scoring system and uh, wherein using the clinical laboratory histological and radiological criteria one can come to the conclusion whether one is dealing with gp mp or egp so if i try to sum up that how do you evaluate a patient who presents with palpable purpura so a skin biopsy is must along with a dif a complete blood count urine analysis and microscopy one must do do anca ana serum protein electrophoresis hbv and c serology blood cultures rheumatoid factor and uh, cryoglobulins are again a part of this kind of workup so if one has uh, this kind of palpable purpura it is important that you have to actually rule out presence of any other cutaneous findings like nodules ulcers libido resmosa and retiform purpura because if these are present then in particular you have to think of septic vasculitis anca associated vasculitis cryoglobulinemia iga vasculitis and leukemic vasculitis so i'll take some time and discuss a little about uh, iga vasculitis as this is we know that this is one of the most common cause of vasculitis in children iga vasculitis was previously known as hinoschonlin purpura and it is an inflammation of small vessels which is caused by perivascular deposition of iga and activation of neutrophils now uh, it was believed that this is actually only limited or more common in children however recent literature has been pointing towards this fact that this this is uh, not true because iga has been increasingly seen in adults and uh, most of the presentations that result of uh, in igav are manifestations of deposition of iga1 in the blood vessel wall this iga vasculitis can present as in three forms it can be systemic vasculitis or a variant of skin limited vasculitis or just restricted to kidneys when it is known as ig nephropathy so whatever be the type a cutaneous purpura is the essential component in uh, igav vasculitis and uh, if i describe this purpura they are palpable purpuric lesions of 2 to 10 mm in diameter that often coalesce the size the site is very characteristic and most of the time it is concentrated on the buttocks and the lower extremities so this is how the site of the uh, igav will look and uh, why this lower extremities are uh, the probable site this is because of the gravity related slower blood flow in uh, these areas cause uh, easier deposition of immunoglobin a in the vessel wall In fact there is a separate variant which is known as AHEI or acute hemorrhagic edema wherein the, uh, the skin limited IGV has associated uh, edema with it but uh, uh, this can uh, but you know this kind of condition is actually a kind of acute condition and uh, rarely occurs during pu puberty because of exclusive edematous component so one must keep in mind this variant of IGV If we look into the pathogenesis of uh, the the various clinical manifestations of IgVa, uh, there are two models. One model which explains why nephritis occurs, and the other model which ex explains why the systemic manifestations of IgVa occurs. In for to explain the nephritis model, there is a four hit theory, wherein the first hit is caused because of increased production of circulating galactose deficient uh, IgA1. Uh, when these are increased they bind to specific iga1 autoantibodies and uh, form the circulating immune complex which is the third hit now when these reach their specific organs as uh, particularly the glomerulus and triggers inflammatory response this is the fourth hit so you see the um, the highlight of this nephritis is actually the critical role of these galactose deficient iga1 
So in this particular picture, if you see that there is this galactose reaction IgA1, which form uh, uh, connect to the IgA antibodies and the uh, circulating immune complex is formed. And this goes and settles in the uh, glomerulus, which result in all the renal manifestations. Whereas if one looks at the systemic manifestations, the cause here is because of uh, some other uh, uh, reason. It is because of elevated anti-epithelial cell antibodies or AECA, uh, which is called this. Now, this AECA again forms complexes with IgA1, which is the second hit. This complex causes production of pro-inflammatory factors like interleukin-8, which in turn stimulates neutrophil recruitment which is the third hit. Once these neutrophils are recruited, uh, they result in uh, the, the clinical manifestations because of uh, ROAs and because of neutrophil endothelial traps. And uh, so we see that in this kind of uh, model, the, the main highlight is on because of these anti-epithelial cell antibodies. So um, these are the culprits which result in that. So this is what is shown in by this uh, cartoon that if you have these anti-epithelial cell antibodies, they bind to uh, these IgA, the complexes recruit neutrophils and the neutrophils release ROS or through neutrophil endothelial traps, they cause all the vascular damage. Uh, whichever pathway or whichever model is involved, what is important is the, the genetics, the epigenetics and the environment uh, could have been, could be the primary triggers which actually ultimately leads to the IgAB or IgV nephritis. So if we describe the clinical manifestations in IgV, there is a classical TRAD which includes palpable purpura, joint pain, GI complaints and renal involvement. Clinically, IgV is typically self-limited. And we have this ULAR um, criteria of HSP where is the presence of purpura is mandatory and one out of these four uh, should be present. But it is, should be a, either a diffuse abdominal plain a pain, a histopathology showing LCV kind of picture, arthritis, and renal involvement in the form of proteinuria or hematuria. So, a combination of purpura with either one of these findings will help you make come to conclusion of IgV, um, IgV nephritis or IgV vasculitis. If we describe the histopathology uh, from the skin in acute phase, it will be LCV kind of uh, picture, whereas uh, with deposition of IgA by TIF, whereas in chronic, it will be hemorrhage and necrotizing vasculitis in dermal small vessels. In the renal in acute phase, there will be diffuse proliferation of mesangial cells and matrix along with segmental necrotizing lesions, endocapillary proliferation, cellular crescents, whereas in chronic phase, there will be glomerular sclerosis tubular loss, interstitial fibrosis, and hyaline arteriosclerosis. And uh, this is the uh, immunofluorescence of IgV nephritis, wherein the Ig deposits are seen in the mesangium and in the capillary wall. So we have described three types of purpura as of now. We have discussed petechiae, macular purpura, and palpable purpura. The next type is known as the retiform purpura. And as the name suggests, the word retiform means branching or net-like. So we'll have a net-like or branching kind of purpura in the uh, skin. And this kind of pattern results because of alteration in blood flow through the dermal and the subcutaneous vasculature. Now, when you see this kind of papura, we'll always try to rule out whether there is an associated component of erythema or not. Erythema, whenever present in any type of purpura, usually points towards an infectious or an inflammatory component. And uh, there is a classical teaching that uh, the purpura necrosis should account for greater than two thirds of lesions. And then uh, uh, you will call it as an occlusion, occlusion kind of syndrome, as opposed to infectious or inflammatory disorders where the lesions will have more of erythematous components. So that means if more of erythematous components are there, then the cause is usually inflammation or infection. Also, if one has fever, the patient has fever, then you are more likely to be dealing with an infectious or inflammatory cause. 
So if, if I try to divide the causes of retiform purpura broadly into two categories, they would be the ones that affect the blood vessel wall and the causes that result because of some pro problem in the intravascular region. Diseases that affect wall will be mostly infections, vasculitis and deposition diseases and uh, intravascular occlusion can result because of thrombosis or embolism. So if, uh, we have discussed that if we are dealing with infiltration in the wall, the most common causes will be infection and the depositional diseases. Infection uh, in particular, uh, when it causes purpura, there is one condition which is called as purpura fulminans. It is actually a uh, life-threatening disorder which most commonly occurs following infection with Neisseria meningitis but can also occur with other infections like varicella, Gruppe streptococcus and streptococcus pneumonia. Now, these patients are obviously very uh, extremely ill appearing. They have fever, hypotension and bleeding and can have an associated DIC. This is how clinically this uh, retiform purpura of meningococcemia will look. The patient will be in hypotension and will be acutely ill. In neonates also there is one condition which is called as neonatal purpura fulminans. This basically is because of congenital severe deficiency of protein C or protein S. Uh, these uh, neonates will also have associated evidence of DIC and if you see a protein C antigen it will be extremely uh, low in quantity. So uh, this actually needs to be repeated several times to come to a conclusion of neonatal purpura fulminans. When we discuss depositional diseases as a cause of uh, blood vessel related causes of retiform purpura, one of the causes of is calciphylaxis, which is a life threatening syndrome of vascular calcification. This is characterized by occlusion of micro vessels in the subcutaneous adipose tissue and dermis. And uh, this is actually a disease with a very poor prognosis. Usually it is seen in end stage renal disease. Now, um, what happens here is actually that the, the vascular smooth muscle cells, they trans differentiate into a, a contractile phenotype. So, the, the phenotype of the vascular smooth muscle cells changes and because of this change, the balance between calcification promoters and inhibitors gets disturbed and uh, uh, because of this the calcium starts getting deposited in within the vessel wall and hence it causes all the clinical manifestations and uh, clinically this is how it can look the uh, retiform lesion sometimes you can see this kind of calcification also and histopathologically this can be confirmed by von Koser's state the second depositional disease which can result in retiform kind of purpura is amyloid purpura. Amyloid can result in purpura, purpuric like lesions because of various factors. It could be because of decrease in circulating factor 10, because of increased fibrinolysis, because of subendothelial depositions of amyloid weakening the blood vessel wall or because of the involvement of liver which causes various defects in the coagulation pathways and hence causes purpura. So we discussed the uh, blood vessel wall related causes of retiform purpura which were mainly infections and depositional diseases and now if we uh, focus on the intravascular causes it could be because of embolism or it could be because of thrombosis. So embolism usually results because of atrial myxoma, cardiac any emboli, any uh, endocarditis or cholesterol kind of uh, embolism and thrombus usually results because of uh, <coughs> deficiency of protein C and S or uh, purpura fulminans and all these causes. So if we try to sum up, how will you approach a patient with a retiform purpura? We are doing whatever we were doing earlier, skin biopsies, CBCs, urine analysis, ANA, ANCA. We now in also pay attention to any elevated calcium, phosphate and parathyroid uh, le uh, levels and uh, actually search the subcutaneous area for anything like calciphylaxis. Now I am discussing drug induced vasculitis separately because drug induced vasculitis is very common and it can present clinically in any of the morphological types that we have discussed till now. Numerous drugs have been associated with purpura and vasculitis, the most commoner ones being sulfonamides, penicillin, chloral hydrate and phenytoin. 
The drug-induced vasculitis usually develops within 7 to 21 days of starting the drug and it may be confined to the skin. So, um, one must also pay attention that the vascular purpurus could result because of inherited disorders. I am discussing the commoner ones here, which are hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasias and uh, the ones associated with congenital connective tissue disorder like Ehlers Danlos syndrome, Marfa syndrome, etc. If we discuss HHT, which was previously known as osler weber endo syndrome, it's an autosomal dominant disorder which, cause, uh, which results in abnormal blood vessel formation. Now, uh, the patient here will have telangiectasias and atovenous malformations. The pathogenesis here is because of mutations in these uh, ENG and uh, BMP9, which causes increased wedge of causing various kinds of AV malformations and telangiectasias. So clinically, the patient will have small telangiectic lesions over the skin, lips, tongue, or palate. There is a Curacao criteria to make a diagnosis of HHT, wherein one has to look for epistaxis, telangiectasias, visceral lesions in the GI tract, pulmonary, or hepatic area, and a family history in a first degree relative. So, because based upon how many criteria are present, one makes a definite possible uh, diagnosis of HHT or one is uh, able to rule out HHT as the cause of the purpura. The second inherited cause which is quite common is Hurler's danlos syndrome, which is a group of inherited disorder that involves the genetic defects in collagen and connective tissue synthesis and structure. Now here the fragility of dermal skill is common and there are frequent bruises and delayed wound healing. So, uh, we have actually discussed the commoner causes of the vascular purpuras and if we try to sum up our approach in a patient in a vascular purpura from clinical and lab point of view. From the clinical point of view or the physical examination point of view, you make notes of whether the patient is an acutely ill appearing patient or is a hemodynamically stable. Look at the skin, look at the distribution of the purpura, their location, whether they are bilateral and uh, in particular in children as for example, whether they are concentrated over only on the lower body buttocks uh, like area. Look whether lymph nodes are there, any hepatosplenomegaly is there, whether joints are involved or not, whether there are any manifestations of neurological signs. Any recent medications is a very important history to be taken. Dietary history helps to make a diagnosis of scurvy. Past important medical histories like any renal diseases, hepatic or malabsorption diseases is very important. From the lab point of view, the um, purpuric lesions, if you classify them broadly by seeing them, whether you are dealing with a petechiae, macules or palpable purpura or reticulum purpura, based on that, the various tests would include CBCs, LFT, RA, uh, liver function tests, renal function tests, coagulation factors, important to rule out any platelet as the cause of being uh, the, uh, any of these purpura. Make sure that you have reviewed the medication intake while doing any of these tests. Palpable purpura, you have to lay real stress upon doing NK, ANCA, ANA, rheumatoid factors, cryoglobulins, hepatitis, serology, and so on. Once you see retiform purpura, also do the uh, echocardiogram and you know calcium and phosphate level, and uh, broadly you will be able to classify the purpura in one or more particular types. So uh, this is the team, this is my lab and where we work at the Advanced Hematology Lab at SMS Medical College and uh, I thank you all for a patient hearing.